a genuine pleasure for me to host this debate on do is assisted dying a human right? It is an issue on which I have an opinion, but it is an opinion which has been quite shallowly formulated, an opinion which is based on a little bit of self-reflection and introspection. It's not a position which has been subject to the kinds of arguments that I know we're going to hear this afternoon. So I have a personal interest in just seeing how that position I hold shapes up against the logic and emotion that is going to be shared with us this afternoon. We have uh, two debaters for the motion, uh, Professor Willem Lundmann. Um, he represents many organizations. He said Stellenbosch University is the one that he wants to be associated with this afternoon. And also supporting the motion is Andrew Fisher, who is a practicing attorney with a very deep interest in the subject of this debate, speaking against Philip Rosenthal from Euthanasia Exposed and Christian View Network, and Dr. Liz Gwither, who is with the Hospice Palliative Care Association and also UCT. Um, Prof. Lundmann <laughs> has, a, a, has a nosebleed issue. So if he suddenly departs, that's the reason, and we will then just wait for him to come back. We hope that he gets through his contribution to the debate, and it would be important that he listens to what the other speakers have to say as well, so when we get to the rebuttal point of the debate, he is able to, to have an opportunity to rebut anything that he finds fallacious. The way it's going to work is that um, Willem will go first, and uh, then we will go to Liz, who will speak against the motion, and then we will go back to uh, Andrew, and then we will go to Philip, and then we will have a 20-minute period where the four speakers will have an opportunity to rebut any points that were made, perhaps support a point made by their co-debater, and after that we'll open it up to the floor. I will be running my stopwatch. Everybody has 10 minutes. There has been an agreement. The rules of engagement are that people must stick pretty close to their 10 minutes. So at nine minutes, I will be giving an indication that there is 60 seconds to go. It feels a bit odd. But, <laughs> but anyway, setting my watch as time are going. But uh, Professor Willem Lundmann, over to you. Please get the debate going. I'll be very brief. Um, let me start with terminology. Uh, by assisted dying, I mean, and some of you know, you have, if you have been here this morning, would would uh, you know, I won't sort of repeat myself in detail. But assisted dying is the voluntary choice to seek assistance with dying by a competent person who suffers, uh, whose suffering is unbearable and intractable, whether terminally ill or not. So it's important to, before any debate about the facts and the values or the norms to get one's terminology in place. So there are two forms of assisted dying. Assisted suicide, which with its um, links with um, other forms of crimes, uh, homicide, uh, you know, a term like self-death, the Afrikaans would be self-do it, is more neutral. What, what we mean by that, A supplies the means to B, who self-administers and dies. The other form is voluntary euthanasia. A supplies and administers the means to B, who dies. They're both forms of assisted dying. In other words, you need somebody su to supply the means or to supply and administer the means. In the title, we have the term human rights. I'll simply talk about rights. And I'll, the, for, for the purpose of this argument, or this debate, I see a right as a claim, a claim that somebody has against someone else who then is under an obligation. Now, it's easy to proclaim a right and say, there is this right. But what I understand by it is the right comes to be in a social or legal practice. In other words, it must be practiced. So then I, having done Having this background of um, uh, the, the, the rele relevant terminology, I asked two questions. First is a factual question. Is there a right to assisted dying, or then particularly a right to assisted dying in South Africa? And the simple answer is no. That practice does not exist. Although I need to qualify it, and I think Andrew will come in on that, it happens 
under the radar in healthcare facilities in South Africa, and I'm sure elsewhere where it's also not legal. So it's a qualified no, but one can also say in other jurisdictions, say in Oregon or in um, the Netherlands, it is universally accepted for everybody in that jurisdiction. So it's universal to that jurisdiction. But universal in terms of rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's not, in fact, a right that's practiced or a right that's recognized in a practice. So then the second question is a normative question or a moral question. Ought there to be such a right? Ought there be to such a right in South Africa? And from this morning, this, that, uh, my talk, you will know that I believe there is. And the two arguments that I think are pivotal are the autonomy argument and the suffering argument. Autonomy or self-determination is something that we value in itself. That's part of being human. That's part of our human nature. That's something that constitutes or that defines us as persons other than simply being guided by um, feelings and emotions or being guided by our genes. So autonomy, argument number one. Number two, suffering that is intractable and unbearable. The fact of that suffering is something that is, unless the suffering is temporary, for example, to tie us over a crisis, if it's there in the sense that it's intractable and unbearable, that is bad in itself. And that is something that we have reason to want to terminate, to stop. Those are the two, I think, pivotal arguments for making assisted, for assisted dying becoming a right in a practice. Against that, and I th I'm sure we will discuss that, are two pivotal arguments, and that is the risk of bad consequences. In other words, abuse, the abuse argument. Now, the, as I've said this morning, that is not a principled argument. It is an empirical argument. It's premised on, on the assumption that Let's forget about these, you know, principled arguments for and against. If we have this practice, can we implement it without abuse or negative consequences? So it's an argument about evidence. It would be evidence from jurisdictions where this practice has been legal, evidence of abuse, but also, on the other side, evidence of the success of safeguards. The issue here is risk. I want to suggest that every human practice, every social or legal practice is accompanied by risk. And because there is risk, we don't abandon or prohibit that practice, not just for that reason. And I want to mention an example. We drive cars on the road. We risk a collision with somebody who is drunk. But we do not, for that reason, ban the practice of driving cars on the roads. We try and institute safeguards that guard against these exceptions. The second argument against is that of playing God. And we've just heard that that is an argument that holds no water, as I've said this morning. Um, how do we know God's will if we accept that God exists? Um, how do we, um, which religions, God are we talking about, and in a particular re religion, what, is, what do the theologians say about an issue like this practice of assisted dying? And then the last point I want to make is that if there is this kind of stalemate between these two different positions from a moral point of view, in South Africa, and it's come out a number of times today, we have to revert to the Constitution, and that's where Andrew will come in. Um, we have to look 
at the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is in itself an ethical document, luckily. So we can interrogate the values, the principles there expressed as rights, as constitutional rights, and ask, do they help us to establish a practice of assisted dying as a social practice? So the moral imperative is to interrogate the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the video of this. <laughs> um, Liz, there, there's been an agreement. Um, you weren't part of it because the agreement was me with me that you now need to hold a tissue up to your nose as well. <laughs> Level the playing fields, indeed. Dr. Liz Gwither. So the question, is assisted dying a human right? The same as um, our colleague, uh, Professor Willi Lundman, I would like to start with terminology. The American Medical Association Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs says that the ethical debate is best served by plainly descriptive language. And they point out that assisted dying can be used to describe either euthanasia and assisted suicide or palliative and hospice care at the end of life. I have recently completed a study using the human rights documents that describe palliative care as a human right. And my in-depth study does not find a right to die or the right to euthanasia in any of these legal covenants agreed by member states of the United Nations. So yes, there is a right to die in the sense of palliative care, but no, there is no right to die in the sense of euthanasia and assisted suicide. So I would say to you that rather than promoting a right to euthanasia and assisted suicide, which does not exist in international law, we should be promoting a right to palliative care that is recognized in international law. If we wish to add to the societal response to the suffering of patients, let us argue for better palliative care services with the express achievable goal of relief of suffering. Therein lies the right and therein lies the hope. When we experience a health or emotional crisis, our whole world is shattered. Our view of the future, our plans, our goals, our personal world is shattered. And we respond with a grief reaction well described by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as stages of denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. This is not a linear path, but there is an adjustment process experienced by anyone in these situations. Doctors and families often try to help people to restore their old life, their previous world, but that's not possible. The role of palliative care is to help people re-script their life stories and to find meaning in the new reality. People are resilient, but the adjustment process takes time and it's facilitated by care and support from family, community and professionals. The new reality does not devalue the individual, nor detract from his or her intrinsic dignity. Individuals do not remain in the state of depression or despair, and we should bring our human compassion to assisting people to rediscover joy in living with their illness or disability, in physical comfort, and with love and respect that restores or enhances dignity. In this debate, we often forget another right here, the right to refuse treatment. That is an appropriate choice medically, ethically, and legally. Often, people advocate for euthanasia and assisted suicide because they fear being kept alive. But no, palliative care stands as a beacon of reason to say you can refuse treatment, you can be allowed to die naturally. The World Health Organization states that palliative care neither hastens nor postpones death. 
euthanasia is not a palliative care nor a health care practice. Palliative care does not promote the use of non-beneficial treatment, which would only prolong the dying process. And the most shameful example of this is Nelson Mandela. Death was in the room with him, holding his hand as an old man's friend. An inappropriate, non-beneficial medical treatment in the form of artificial ventilation prolonged his dying for another seven months. He did not require euthanasia. He required to be allowed a natural end to his life. The strongest argument for euthanasia is that of individual autonomy. We know that serious illness impacts and compromises our autonomy through pain, through insomnia, depression, emotional problems, and it's important to address these issues to enha enhance autonomy. We also know that people change their minds. Christian Bush describes the process of finding meaning in illness and loss as swinging like a pendulum between loss and benefit of the illness, between powerlessness and control, between sorrow and joy, the wish to die and the will to live. He describes our role in palliative care and I suggest as a caring community as swinging with the patient and providing support as people adjust to the new reality, helping them to find a meaning in this ambiguity. We know that people adapt to the circumstances they experience, and although they may have expressed the wish to die, they change their minds and then express the will to live. For that natural pendulum to be stopped unnaturally deprives the patient and family of something we see over and over again in the care of our patients. Expressions of love, the unexpected encounter, indeed the epiphany that may occur with a natural death. A submission to the UK Select Committee debating euthanasia in 2016 made the statement that autonomy is only valid when it recognizes other moral values, such as respect for human life. And one of the MPs, Dr. Philippa Whitford, said that as a doctor, I know that euthanasia is not a good treatment for anything. I myself also expressed the view in palliative care that offering an individual death instead of effective pain control is a gross violation of their human rights. We do not have to kill the sufferer to relieve the suffering. A seminal article describing sympathy, empathy, and compassion describes how patients experience sympathy as an unwanted pity-based response characterized by lack of understanding and self-preservation of the observer. This pity, rather than empathy, has led to what philosophers call moral disengagement. The disengagement mechanisms are moral justification, using extreme arguments to obtain agreement for the unthinkable, the use of euphemistic language, medical aid in dying rather than euthanasia or assisted suicide, and minimizing or disregarding harmful consequences of actions leading to dehumanization. Professor Daniel Nkayana in his editorial in the South African Medical Journal in 2012 wrote that there's a real risk of euthanasia becoming a substitute for proper care in the South African situation. Laws are made to protect society and disability groups the world over, such as Not Dead Yet, oppose the legalization of assisted suicide, pointing out that we live in a society which valorizes the able body and the able mind to the extent that to be disabled in any way is to be highly devalued to the extent that it is better to be dead than disabled. The right to die could become the duty to die for these people, and they call for assisted living rather than assisted dying. It is a time to return to a community of respect for one another and genuine care for one another. And it is here in South Africa with the example of the African philosophy of Ubuntu that provides an imperative and an example of caring for each other that will provide the foundation for a resurgence of caring communities. 
The false binary that is set up in these debates is that of intolerable suffering and premature death. There is another way, palliative care within a caring community that supports both autonomy and dignity. I will end with a quote from the poet W.H. Arden, who says we must love one another or die, because it seems to me that this is the real choice we are facing in this debate, love or death. Um, thank you, Liz, and attorney, Andrew. Thanks a lot, John. I'm going to assume Willem's terminology um, in my contribution and approach it from a legal point of view, um, which is my area of relative expertise. Um, so I'm going to address the question, is assisted dying a human right um, from a human rights law point of view, with a particular focus on constitutional law? Um, the main claim I'm going to make is, you'll see quite a conservative claim, and that is that assisted dying um, as a constitutionally protected human right is in principle consistent with principles of a modern liberal constitutional democracy. This is an in principle claim, it's not an all things considered claim. So I'm looking at the constitution and in particular I'll focus on the South African constitution. And I'll make the argument that there is scope for developing the current law of South Africa um, in line with the values of the constitution such that it allows assisted dying. And that is consistent with a modern liberal constitutional democracy. To address the descriptive legal question of whether assisted dying is a human right, there again, um, it is recognized as a legal human right in some jurisdictions, um, and I'd like to draw attention to Canada in particular. And that's because Canada, like South Africa, is a constitutional democracy, and they have a Bill of Rights, just like we do. Um, in Canada, uh, the Carter case paved the way for legislation allowing assisted dying. Um, and in the Carter case, the, the court in that case basically held that the prohibition on assisted dying, um, making assisted dying a common law crime of murder or culpable homicide um, from the point of view of the person assisting the patient, was an overbroad limitation on the constitutionally protected right to control over one's body, so the bodily integrity right. Um, so descriptively, in some jurisdictions, yes, it is recognized as a human right. The more interesting question is the normative question, should it be recognized as a human right, and in particular, should it be recognized as a human right in South Africa, taking into account our particular context? Um, Descriptively, in South Africa, uh, physician-assisted euthanasia is unlawful. Um, consent is not a defense to murder or couple of homicide, and that is the state of our current law. Um, it's not the case that physician-assisted suicide is always unlawful. In other words, um, in some cases, in certain limited circumstances, physician-assisted suicide could be lawful. And that's in particular, that depends on the facts and the circumstances of the case. But it can be lawful if, amongst other things, the causal chain between providing the means for suicide and the patient independently, completely independently, as an independent act committing suicide, if that causal chain is broken. Amongst other things, um, the courts have recognized that that can, in principle, um, be lawful. And again, this is in very, very narrowly circumscribed circumstances. And onto the normative question, should it be a legally protected right in South Africa? I think that there is scope for legal recognition for assisted dying in South Africa, uh, but this would be in principle consistent with the values of the constitution. Um, and as Willem mentioned, the constitution is an aspirational ethical document which embodies the values um, of dignity, equality, and fundamental freedoms. I'm going to suggest that the constitu constitutional issue can be framed as, on the one hand, the state having a legitimate interest in protecting life, including dying life, so uh, one's life at the end of one's life. Um, and on the other hand, the individual's 
freedom, right to freedom, and in particular physical and psychological integrity. So that's a right to having control over one's body, which also I would argue includes control over one's body and mind, the freedom to live one's life as one chooses. So if we frame the constitutional issue thus, um, I would argue that the assisted dying can be recognized um, as legally protected in accordance with the Constitution, and that could be achieved in at least two ways. One would be to develop the current common law through the courts in line with the Bill of Rights in terms of Section 39.2 of the Constitution, which obliges courts to develop the common law where it is inconsistent with the value, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. And the other would be through the legislative process, so um, through a democratic process, including public participation, where a bill is proposed, debated in Parliament, and ultimately passed by Parliament. And here I'm thinking something along the lines of the South African Law Reform Commission's recommendations in 1997. They actually recommended that uh, legislation be put in place, legalizing assisted dying to some extent, and in very uh, narrowly prescribed circumstances. That uh, recommendation has not yet been implemented. Um, but I would argue that implementing those recommendations in the form of uh, democratically sanctioned uh, legislation um, would balance the state's duty to protect life with a person's right to choose whether to and how to end his or her life. Um, I'm going to speak a bit more about the development of the common law approach. Uh, this would look like developing the common law of murder and culpable homicide in line with the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. And that's in terms of Section 39.2. And um, this would have to be a two-step process. So how constitutional or development of the common law in terms of the Constitution works is that you first have to show that there's some right in the Bill of Rights which has been limited or is being limited by the current common law. And once you've done that, you still have to just, you have to argue that it's a justifiable, it's an unjustifiable limitation of that right. So there's a two-step process. You first have to show that a right, a constitutional right is, is invoked, that the current state of law infringes that right, and that that infringement is unjustifiable in terms of section 36 of the constitution. There's a limitations analysis that needs to be done. And the common law can only be developed if the court finds that there's been an unjustifiable limitation of a constitutional right. So I would argue that how this would look in principle, again, um, is a development of the common law of murder and culpable homicide in line with the right to dignity. So arguing that there's been an infringement of the right to dignity in terms of section 10. And that reads that everyone has inherent dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. Dignity is a central value of the Constitution, which has been called an objective normative value system for South Africa. Um, South Africa has been founded, according to the Constitution, Section 1, on values of human dignity, equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. Uh, the second possible right that could be invoked here apart from the right to dignity is the right to bodily integrity in terms of section 12 2 b of the Constitution. And that reads that everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, including the right to security in and control over one's body. And here in particular, security in one's body and control over one's body must be distinguished. And what I have in mind here is control over one's body, which is the relevant right that's invoked. Uh, and what that means is that one has bodily and psychological autonomy or self-determination, um, essentially the freedom of informed autonomous adults to live the life that they choose, including control over their body and mind. Um, in my view, dying is a part of life, and dying well is a part of living a life well. And so it's important for an individual to be able to exercise informed free choice over one's dying process to the extent possible in one's circumstances. I've got one minute left. Um, so that's how it would look in principle. And again, my central claim is that 
if the law were to be developed in line with the Bill of Rights, in particular the right to dignity or the right to bodily integrity, that would be consistent with the underlying values of the Constitution in principle um, and with the principles underlying a modern liberal constitutional democracy like South Africa's. The second route would be legislation along the lines of the Law Reform Commission recommendations, and perhaps this would be preferable um, to have a, a, a well-ventilated and democratic uh, process. Um, in fact, this was the view of the judge in the SEA case, which, which overturned the order in Stransom Ford's Pretoria High Court case. He expressed the opinion that it would be better to do this through legislation and that this is the proper area. And I'm out of time. But those were the essential points that I wanted to make. Thank you. And uh, then just to close off this part of the debate, Philip. OK, great. I'm going to be looking at two separate areas. The one is to just state the uh, Hippocratic Oath viewpoint, which is also held by the, the Christian faith and many others uh, who share that view. Uh, and But then as a second look is to... Uh, look at these definitions of what of those who advocate uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia to what their definitions are and where they draw the line as to what is right and what is wrong and i would argue that that is very difficult to be consistent on those points so firstly to uh, state the Hippocratic Oath position, which is an opposition to prescribing any sort of deadly medicine, helping to kill anybody, or giving any suggestion to that effect, uh, which is upheld by the Christian faith and has been accepted by many societies around the world. Now, there were many societies which had exceptions to that, for example, in allowing uh, gladiatorial killing for entertainment, uh, killing infants, as we heard earlier from the Human Rights Commission, killing of twins, um, <clears throat> but this is something which is an absolute, and we would not accept any exceptions to that where you have an innocent human being. Now. The, the next question is uh, the question of why, and I would, just to illustrate that, I'm going to hold up two pieces of paper. This is a, a 200 rand note. Uh, this is a blank piece of paper. The one has value. You can get money for it. Why does it have value? Is it because you attribute value to it or somebody else attributes value to it? No, it's because there's an image printed on this piece of paper where the government is put its mark on it and it has said this piece of paper is worth 200 rand. Uh, similarly, uh, the view that human beings are created in the image of God is something totally distinct to any animal. If you walk outside and you see a dead bird on the road, you're probably going to carry on walking. But if you see a dead person on the road, you're going to report that to the police. Uh, you are not allowed to move that body, according to our law, anywhere without uh, <coughs> having that uh, police permission. Uh, and our entire legal structure works around this assumption. And I would argue that these arguments about developing the common law uh, are flawed in multiple respects. Firstly, uh, because this has been a foundational pillar of our whole legal system for thousands of years. This is not a minor change to in developing the common law. There's nothing explicit in our constitution which would give an indication that there was any intention of the Constitutional Assembly to uh, legalize euthanasia or uh, assisted suicide. In fact, when those views were brought to that same group of people, in uh, 1999, uh, they completely rejected these proposals that were put forward. Uh, by the way, the South African Law Reform Commission proposed three alternatives, one of which was to keep the law the same. Uh, it didn't recommend explicitly legalizing assisted suicide. It just gave an option that if it was to be done, these are two options on how it could be done. Uh, Parliament and the Department of Health did not accept those recommendations, and it ended up being uh, formally rejected in 2004. I can, if you want to go onto euthanasiaexposed.co.za, you can see a list of nine different occasions where Parliament has discussed the matter. Uh, they rejected it. I don't think there was a single member of Parliament who actually stood up in favor of that. Um, but now to challenge the alternative view of a definition of where can uh, exceptions be made, and now I'm going to try and put the hat on of my opposition and say, okay, well, if one accepts that there could be some instances where it might be acceptable, where are you going to draw that line? 
And we just heard from the first speaker the criteria of choice, uh, competent choice, and unbearable and or intractable suffering. Now, I want to draw to the attention that when Dignity SA started its campaign about four years ago, the criteria was terminally ill. That was what I was reading at the time. Then, uh, in 2015, uh, I challenged uh, the president of this organization at the Bi UCT Bioethics uh, Symposium on the question, because he had confessed to assisting the suicide of Anrich Berger, and as to this person was not terminally ill. And his response was, it boils down to the individual and their own perception of unbearable suffering. So now we have an in the question of the interpretation of unbearable no longer as an objective decision by some external agency or some legal definition, but up to each person to define for themselves what they consider un unbearable suffering. And I think I heard that viewpoint echoed by uh, the CEO of the Human Rights Commission earlier today, where he suggested that, uh, you know, this could be an alternative, safer alternative to jumping off a building. Now, my question is, that is a very, very wide definition because then it's really the only criteria is up to the individual's choice and their competence. Then I would argue the problem that you, you have a number of problems there. Uh, one of those problems is the question that people of who are suicidal are usually varying in their wish to uh, commit suicide, and that links in with the mood swings that uh, Liz Guaida was talking about uh, in the Kubler-Ross grieving cycle. And, but if that person commits suicide at that moment, it is now irreversible, and when can that consent be considered something final that, uh, for that person, because one cannot turn around. So that is a, a huge problem. Furthermore, there is, uh, no individual takes a decision on their own. They are influenced by friends and family. They are influenced uh, by their healthcare workers, what other people say. And they are also influenced by the social milieu, the media, and including what organizations like yourself are saying. And I've listened to people who, uh, from speaking from overseas in jurisdictions such as Belgium, and now increasingly in Canada, that they say, well, people say to them, a disabled person, if I was you, I would commit suicide. Now, well, the way that they hear that is, why don't you commit suicide? So that is, a, a, and that person can always deny, no, I wasn't trying to put pressure on that person to commit suicide, but subtly, that is the way those people hear that, and that is why something that they, uh, they, they perceive as pressure. And more than that, some, I saw an interview, somebody in Belgium, uh, so it was a disabled child and has had people come and walk up to him in the street of why don't you euthanize your child? Um, now, this to me is where you have a shift from cons the whole area of consent and to the wards area of pressure. And I believe that over time, more of this will be exposed and it's going to become more and more ugly. Then to draw to the attention the previous experiment that happened in the 1930s in Germany. Now, I'm not drawing a, co a comparison between what we are doing, uh, what is being done now in the Netherlands with what happened in the 1940s, but I do compare with what happened in the 1930s, okay? Which is where initially, and I can show you documents and newspaper articles from the time of the 1930s in Germany, uh, including a letter signed by Adolf Hitler himself, giving criteria much the same as what people are talking about right now, but the end consequence of that slippery slope went to something extreme when it was combined with a political uh, agenda. Now, we do have crazy politicians in this country, which I hope never come to power, but uh, that is a, a risk in a politically unstable environment. We also have a situation in our context where we have several million people who are infected with an incurable illness, HIV AIDS. In my view, those people are valuable. Their right to life is sacred. I don't want any pressure being put on those people towards uh, <coughs> committing suicide. And we had this incremental expansion of criteria in the 1930s and a loss of conscience among doctors. One then, even in the concentration camp, had selection of people for euthanasia by medical doctors, and we had the same equipment, the gas chambers being used in those concentration camps, 
as what had been previously designed by academics in psychiatric institutions in Germany. So to me, there is a continuum here, and I see a number of parallels. Also, this use of euphemisms. Uh, another concerning issue that I have to bring up again because it was asked earlier, uh, you say which version? Which version of the Christian faith one had in the, in the 19th century the development in Germany of a <clears throat> view in uh, <clears throat> the church that human life was not sacred, that human beings kind of could make things up as they go along instead of the, expand uh, the authority of the Bible. That gutted the German church. That view has now spread throughout the Western world. And if you want to ask why are the, is the church in some of these jurisdictions no longer standing up to this, it's because they are infected with the same thinking. Nobody outside of that stream of thinking in Christian history has ever supported euthanasia or assisted suicide. Okay. <laughs> Simply that we've heard all four points of view. That's all. Um, We'll go from this side to that side, and um, Willem, if you would like to, to go first, or whether Andrew, you would like to go first, I don't think we have to, to keep it I'll, clockwork and alphabetical as it were. Um, um, let's just see. Uh, is the, um, I missed the briefing. Do you want me to ask a question? No, well, if, if you want to rebut any uh, point made by either Liz okay. or Philip, you're welcome there, to do there, so. There were, there were many points made. Yes. I think. Uh, how much time do I have, John? One, um, minute. One minute. Well, we've got 20 minutes, and okay. uh, so uh, you, you, can, okay. you can each have five minutes. You can use it in one go, or you can use it in small bites. Up to you. I want to start with the analogy with Hitler and Nazi Germany. I've made the point this morning that it's totally inappropriate, and I object to that. And I object on behalf of people who suffered in Auschwitz. When asked after the, time, after the fact, when they were octogenarians, whether they saw any analogy, any resemblance, any likeness between what Hitler's program was, nominally euthanasia was used, and medical um, assisted suicide in a medical context, they overwhelmingly said no. Those were the people who were in Auschwitz. <coughs> I think we should respect that, and I think this debate should not even touch on that. That the slippery slope would lead to, to Nazi Germany. I also think it's not useful to invoke the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath was written 2,500 years ago. My experience in the United States is when our students, when I was attached to the, the Medical School of the University of North Carolina, one of the campuses, the senior students wrote their own Hippocratic Oath. For the simple reason that some of those stipulations are not longer appropriate. We have modern medicine 2,500 years since then. In the Hippocratic Oath, one of the major stipulations is that medical students upon graduation should look after the financial interests of their medical professors. And I would say, unless they do that, we don't have to look at the Hippocratic Oath as guidance, as guidance in terms of public, public policy for in the euthanasia debate. What I want to ask Liz, my nosebleed, let's assume it gets worse and worse and it's the first symptoms of something really grave. I become bedridden, I'm treated in various ways, palliative, I appreciate that, I think it's important, of course, that's what I said this morning, this is first base. But I suffer pain and distress. You treat me, you treat me, you treat me, and I say, I've reached the end. I'm confused, there's no hope, the diagnosis is I'm terminally ill. I do not want terminal sedation. My question is, who are you, and I don't mean it dis with disrespect, who are you to decide for me that you can treat my suffering in the way you think appropriate, thereby actually making nonsense of my autonomy, given that my death, my dying is part of my life? You, my, my assertion is that you do not have a proper understanding or appreciation of autonomy what it means, and ultimately then 
it has to be resolved in terms of what is possible uh, in South Africa in terms of uh, public policy. And my question would then be, how would you, how would you like public policy to be written to both of, uh, of the contributors on the other side? On the basis of referring to Christian religion, to the Hippocratic Oath, what is practiced in South Africa, what do you think international agreements say? What is the respect you have for our constitution, assuming that, as my colleague has said, there's a very strong argument, argument to be made for that. Why do you ev evade the constitution and call upon other criteria, other, other standards? Thank you. Okay, this something was directed at you, so perhaps you can pick up, uh, respond to Willem, and then if you'd like to pick up on any other points Willem made or um, a point that um, Andrew made, you're welcome. Thank you. So I think one of my concerns is a lot of um, the discussions around the reasons for euthanasia are based on fear and imaginings, and people are really um, anxious about this unbearable, intractable suffering. And I know I've had 25 years of experience in palliative care. I have never had to use terminal sedation. I don't know if I'm, if I'm being oh, heard. Just keep going. And, so, um, no, I was just saying I've never had to use, use terminal yeah. sedation for any of my patients. It's very, very rare. I have had one of my colleagues who has used terminal sedation for a man who had existential suffering that the um, small degree of sedation that usually will contain anxiety and allow people still to be active and alert and engaged with their family um, wasn't able to be contained. So one person in my 25 years has ever needed to use that. What I find but is that's, that... But that's not a di that's not an answer to the direct question so of I'm what about right to go do on you now, have. So. Okay. so what I have found in, um, in my uh, practice as a palliative care physician is that it is a team that works with a patient and family. And the leader of the team respecting the autonomy is the patient. And the family is a really important part of that. And sometimes the discussions and debates and disagreements between family and patient. But the pa it's patient-led. And always what the patient wishes. And what I have found in my experience, and so when people say, oh, but we should have euthanasia for terminal conditions, I say that's the last thing that we should have euthanasia for. That's a person who is already on the path, and what we must make sure is that person is comfortable, and the WHO definition says to prolong active living. So I say to people, you don't have to go home and turn your, bed, your face to the, the wall and wait to die. We can make sure that you don't have pain. We can make sure that you have active, good quality life engaging with your family to the end of your life. And the thing that we do note is that time, when time is short, time is precious. And there are these two extremes of vitalism. My friends in Ohio say that this is the right to life state, and they will go, use all sorts of interventions just to keep somebody alive that may be inappropriate. And then there's the nihilism about the despair about, then I'm going to die. And in between is where most people are. And all of my patients have found that life is worth living to the end to a natural death. So the person still has the autonomy, and the person needs to um, be really well contained as far as pain and suffering goes, so that the pain and suffering is no longer unbearable and intractable, and I can't do that on my own. I need my colleagues in hospice who are the counselors and who can help with, I find existential suffering to be a much more difficult thing to deal with than physical suffering. I can manage physical pain and suffering well. And that, so we really truly believe in the autonomy of the patient and the dignity of the patient. So we do but, support the constitution. But the, the, the autonomy of the patient, I want to die. I want to be allowed to die. That's an autonomous decision. And you don't seem to acknowledge that. I think it's because right. it hasn't, I haven't 
come across it as a sustained request. So, for example, we had a, a we had somebody who came into hospice, who was coming into hospice with the express wish to die, and then discovered that that's not a hospice philosophy, and then got the the treatment and the counselling and the the care that um, he received and then went home to his family in, in Port Elizabeth and wrote back to our social work counsellor saying, I am so grateful that you didn't accede to my wish because I have had the best six months of my life. So okay, it's just that I don't, just, I don't just see that balance. as um, I've not experienced that as a sustained request. Andrew, is there anything you'd like to pick up on? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'd like to comment on a couple of points. Um, first, uh, I'm in complete agreement that we need quality palliative care and more equalized access to that, broader access to that, especially in South Africa. Uh, my suggestion is that that doesn't have to be an either or thing. It's not either we have um, access to quality palliative care or we have a right to assisted dying, you can have them both simultaneously. And the right to die just extends, um, extends a patient who is um, experiencing unbearable suffering by that patient's own lights, um, despite quality palliative care, um, extends that, that patient's autonomy. And I would ask, well, what's the harm in giving that patient the option, the choice? Um, to exercise that right as an extension of the right to autonomy, um, despite access to palliative care, etc. Um, yes, and then on the the risk of uh, assisted dying as a substitute for proper care, that's that's not what I propose or support at all, and I, th I would suggest that that's a risk that must be managed. Um, just like any other risks of allowing a potentially harmful practice, it's let's let's focus on the benefits in terms of increased autonomy for the patients who are in circumstances where they wish to exercise that choice, um, and minimise the risks where we can, like we do with driving, like we like we do with the regulated use of alcohol. Um, let's not confuse the risk of abuse with the benefits that can come um, from a safe. Uh, well-functioning assisted dying regime that's effectively implemented and enforced. Uh, I acknowledge that there are empirical issues around to what extent that can be effectively enforced uh, and regulated in South Africa and there's all sorts of empirical things that we need to take into account in terms of the public health system. So let's, I'm not making any empirical claims, I don't claim to have enough evidence to have a definitive view on that. My, my claim is an in principle one that it's consistent with the constitution and that in principle we can have a assisted dying regime in South Africa that more fully expresses patients' right for autonomy. And the underlying thing is actually respect for human life. I don't think we're, we're at odds about that. The underlying concern is a respect for, for human life. Um, and um, I've lost my train of thought. But the final thing I'll say is that um, the the claim that it's a choice between love or death is a false dilemma. It's not either love or death. I mean, often in cases where we extend that right to sort of dying to patients, we're acting out of love. Um, and we're coming from a place of respect for human life. So I think that sometimes there's an unnecessary perception of conflict where if you look deeper, the underlying interests and concerns are quite similar. Philip? Okay, I would like to ask a question, and I'd also like to rebut some of the, or answer some of the points that are made, but my big question, which I would like to ask everybody in this room, we can have a discussion afterwards or later, is where are you going to draw the line of where is this wrong? And you will say that things that are on the other side of the line are murder, and you will condemn that as murder, and I will give three dimensions to that. One is the other people in this room who are doing things that are crossing that line, the other jurisdictions that are crossing that line, and in the future, one day, if your own organization then decides that they are going to expand those criteria, will you say that is murder or will you just travel with that wherever these other people go? Because I think it's very dangerous if you have flexible ethics like this that are just going to continually expand if you look how quickly they've been moving already. So that's my question to you. Then the, the next... Uh, 
issue is just the, the, the fudging of the question of dignity, and there are three areas of dignity. Inherent dignity, that is all of us because we are made in the image of God, we are unique human beings that are different to animals. Secondly, subjective dignity, what you attribute to somebody else, where you think that somebody who is disabled or cannot take themselves to the loo has a, a lack of dignity. And the third area of dignity is uh, <clears throat> your view, your perception of an action such as suicide, and marketing can change the perception of an action. Uh, your viewpoint can change perceptions. But I would argue that every human being remains with that inherent dignity because of what is imprinted on them. Now, the question that was asked from the other side is the question of the right to refuse. I wouldn't put that right with a doctor at all. I would say that is something needs to be uniformly implemented in the law, not left up to the discretion of the doctor. Now, when there has been a pretension of putting uh, the right in the hands of a doctor, inevitably what we have seen is that certain doctors who uh, are specialized in that, they lose their conscience against killing and then they will progressively expand those criteria and become more and more lenient and other doctors of the same opinion are the ones that hold them accountable and in the end there is no accountability at all, it's an illusion. So. I think one cannot have the decision being made on a medical criteria. It's not up to them, the doctors, to decide. One has to say, no, it is not allowed. Then the question of an empirical claims of proof of abuses. There were many affidavits that were put forward in the uh, Stranson Ford case relating to abuses that were going on uh, in Oregon, in Washington State, in the USA, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. And I think anybody can, is welcome to, to view those things. Uh, if you would like that, I will have them put up on uh, our website. Either of you like to pick up on anything that has been said? Willie? Um, maybe, you know, uh, Philip has brought up the whole, um, I think it's an ethical but also religious idea of the image of God. We indeed are created in the image of God. We can, I, I, can, I can use that in a religious context or in a secular context. In other words, that human beings have special moral value uh, because in virtue of certain characteristics that they have that other animals don't have, although they, sh they overlap with higher primates. But what does that mean? It means amongst other things, that we have reason with special abilities, consciousness, higher consciousness, self-consciousness, discursive self-consciousness. That is part of nature. We can use our reason to decide, to put it crudely, to have assisted dying as public policy, protected in various ways, to give recognition to the evil of unnecessary suffering and to respect people's autonomy. I do not think by simply mentioning being created in the image of God, anything follows from it. You know, just as, as if there's, a, there's, there's one, one meaning to it. So we can certainly interpret it as a way that gives us a uh, license to, to, to adopt certain public policies that are, um, that, that, that are defensible. Maybe I should ask this, and it's something that I raised this morning. All these dangers that you foresee with assisted dying, how are they different from decisions being made to withhold or withdraw life-supporting treatment, which is standard of care and is done regularly in, in, in South African and other hospitals or medical facilities? Are the same risks not at issue? Are the same variables not at issue? That we have to decide about the time and manner and place of death by withdrawing or withholding treatment. That we have certain Im uh, motives, certain intentions, certain deliberation, decision, responsible action for which we have responsibility. How, what is the difference such that we can say that all cases of withholding or withdrawing treatment fall in that class and all cases of assisted dying fall in that class and they are bad and these are acceptable in terms of risk. Liz, I think as a medical doctor, perhaps that's for you to answer. 
Well, I would say in terms of risk, there is no difference. In terms of what is happening, there's a huge difference. And I am concerned at the big disconnect between the medical fraternity and the legal fraternity here, with the legal fraternity pronouncing on really kind of uh, skills in the medical um, in, in medicine, so that for the, the decision to not start or not continue a non-beneficial treatment, so withholding or withdrawing treatment, is really that we've maybe started that treatment with the intent to reverse, is this condition reversible? Is it not? We think it might be, so let's start it. But let's do this for a week. If there's not any change, then this is a non-beneficial treatment and it is not ethical to give non-beneficial treatment to our patients. So then we will stop it. The, the, risk of, um, the risk of dying is higher there because death is already in the room. The risk of giving an injection or a lethal dose of medication is bringing death a lot earlier in a person's life and causing a premature death. <laughs> a lone clap from an otherwise hostile audience. Um, we, we have a little bit of time. If, if Andrew, you'd like to make one more little point, and uh, Philip, you'd like to make one more short point, and then we'll open up to the floor. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll preface my comment by saying that I um, acknowledge that any, any regime that is put in place, if one is put in place for us to dying, obviously needs to be well thought out. They need to be adequate, appropriate, empirically verifiable safeguards in place, um, and appropriate breaks on any abuses. Um, if, in principle, we're able to put such a regime in place, um, who is harmed um, if a terminally ill patient um, is in a room and death is in the room, has received quality palliative care, does not want terminal sedation, has discussed it with his or her family, and all are agreed that it's in this patient's best interests to, uh, to bring death forward. Who is harmed by allowing that? Okay. Um, Philip, do you want to answer that directly, or would you like to say something else? And then we'll open it up to the floor. Okay. I would both give an answer to that and also push for an answer to my previous question. Um, <clears throat> the, firstly, I would say that the the, the New Zealand judgment on uh, Sean Davidson repeated on three occasions that the reason for gu the guilty finding was because of the sanctity of life. One cannot get around that. That links to the image of God. Who is harmed? That person is harmed. Uh, the law of the country is harmed. One also has the huge issue of social impacts. We're dwelling on the individual now, but we have the issue of social impacts. If this precedent, which is a subjective right uh, decided by each individual is accepted with the circumstance of pressure, that is going to have a huge ripple effect on society and the devaluation of the, uh, the aged, the sick, the weak, and possibly extension to many of these other aspects, such as infanticide, which has already started taking place in the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, and other loss of, the, of respect for human life in other areas, uh, which have always historically accompanied uh, groups that have supported this, uh, the suicide. But then to answer the question of withdrawal all of extraordinary care. Um, the, the standard, the minimum standard is ordinary care, that is food, uh, warmth, uh, basic medication, not extraordinary care, which is uh, ventilators, what happens in a hospital, just the ordinary care which is given at home, which we would expect everybody to have as a, a minimum standard. That extraordinary care is a bonus which is given temporarily to help pe people. Uh, if it's not available in some countries at all, uh, that is uh, not a huge ethical complication, and uh, the medical people have to make decisions with their limited resources in that situation. Then to say the image of God. Uh, okay, thank okay. You. Um, so we have a microphone up here. I would ask that those of you who, who want to use it, that you not make lengthy speeches, that you try and frame the point you want to make as a question to one of the panelists in a relatively short manner, because I don't know what appetite there is. 
to ask questions and, and to make brief points about what you've heard. But, but please don't go into extended diatribes. Um, there was a hand up at the back. Perhaps we will, if, if you wouldn't mind just coming forward and then lining up behind the microphone. And then, no, but we're filming this, so we need to record it both in terms of sound and, and video. Come, come forward. Anybody who would like to make a point, come forward. And if you wouldn't mind just waiting one behind the other, take your turn at the mic. Okay. I am Rob Jonquier. I am the executive director of the World Federation. But I used to be a general practitioner who practiced euthanasia. And when I hear the arguments used by the other side of the table, I feel I have to stand up and tell you that I practice, I accompanied a couple of patients with euthanasia. And I don't feel like I should feel if I hear you if I am a criminal. I have guided those patients. I got about 10 requests in my life as a family doctor, and I guided only two. And I guided those people having given them, as is now called, extensive palliative care. One of the cases, after the first request, it took six months before we finally applied the euthanasia. And I want to stress especially, and I want to know that, first of all, European Palliative Care Association acknowledges that palliative care, even best palliative care, is not able to treat all suffering. So that kind of thing like uh, euthanasia are still ne necessary. So that's what I would just want to uh, attribute to the contribution. Okay. Let's say, uh, if, no, okay. We silence from this side. Okay, Liz says she does respect that. Um, Vili, could you maybe pull down the microphone? Or, there we yeah. go. Um, I'm Colin Brewer. I'm a retired psychiatrist, so in the course of psychiatry, I never had to face questions of euthanasia personally. But I'd li I have one question for um, uh, the palliative care doctor and a comment for uh, Mr. Rosenthal. The, f the comment is that I very much resent lectures on the sanctity of life from the spiritual descendants of John Calvin and the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> I mean... You, you talk about the sanctity of life. People like me, who happen not to believe in, in a deity, um, were burnt alive regularly and in t tens of thousands by your spiritual forebears. You have a lot to answer for, and you should be embarrassed. <laughs> and my, my question is this. I'd like to put a very simple clinical example to Dr. Gwynn. Uh, suppose I am a cancer patient in my 60s, and uh, I have had quite a bit of treatment, and including quite a bit of chemotherapy and exo, which is very nasty, but has given me several remissions. You said a, a patient always has a right to refuse treatment. Suppose I say to you, you're offering me another course of surgery or radiotherapy uh, or chemo, doctor, I know that the chances of a successful outcome get less with each course, and the last one was pretty bloody awful, but I put up with it. I'm not sure whether I can cope with another course with maybe a 10 or 20% chance of success, but let me, let me strike a bargain with you. Uh, if you will guarantee that you will offer me assisted dying when I want it, I'm willing to take the risk of having a further course and if it works out well, that's fine. But if it doesn't, and I feel even worse, I'd like you to recognize that I've taken the risk, that it's failed, and I'd like you to end my, help me to end my life. Now, if you, if you refuse, you are condemning me to die earlier than I might otherwise do because the treatment, uh, you, you will not offer me the chance of treatment, and I may well die rather quickly. If you agree, I might live for another three or four years. What are you going to do? So thank you, doctor, for that question. I'm going to ask you, what do you want? And I've, told within... you what, I've told you what I want. I want a bargain with you so that so... If, if the choice of treatment does not work out to my advantage, I want my life ended. That's what I want. 
So as a palliative care doctor, I'm more likely to uh, support your wish not to have the further chemotherapy and radiotherapy. It is one of the discussions that we often have with patients who say, no, I don't want to do it anymore. And we um, are very strongly in support of that option to refuse treatment. No, I, I won't let you escape from that hook. I'm not, off, I'm not asking you to advise me not to have palliative I, I, care I, I, I think she's saying work. that she's not going to take your... I'm not going to take the offer. Oh, you're not? No. So you're condemning me to die earlier rather than the well, longer life that I might have? Well, research shows that, in fact, palliative care tends to extend life over what oncology care does. That's the recent research that's been coming um, through. Research cannot tell you about individual patients. No, I'm an individual absolutely. patient. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next. Hello, everyone. I think I could be considered a layman in this whole subject. I'm a fairly recent uh, joiner of uh, Dying with Dignity Canada, and also in a country where it's been running for two, two and a half years now. By the way, the sky has not fallen, the churches have not blown up, and people aren't running around killing people in the streets. Things are very normal and common, and an incredibly positive experience. I get this secondhand, but I get it. What I want each of the panel members, and I will say that this is an issue with, uh, with probably three out of four of you, a lot of the conversations and arguments, whether they be ethical, legal, political, religious, are all the outside looking in to the patient. How many of you have the perspective or the experience of watching someone die, whether it be a relative or a patient, and that's why I say the, the doctor here may be closer to this than others. What about that experience of being on the inside looking out, where the legal, political, religious perspectives are rather distant and irrelevant? It's all about me, and I, have seen my parents near death, I didn't watch them die. But unless you've actually been with someone in their final hours, as a doctor or as a family member, you have not yet distanced yourselves from all of the hypothetical, and in some cases fabricated, uh, things that might go wrong, might be bad, might be this, might be that. It's real and it's firsthand and it's right now. So I'm encouraging you to comment on how difficult would it be for each of you to pretend and imagine yourselves to be on the inside looking out, wearing those shoes, lying in that bed, having those things, those things put in you, and having perhaps good palliative care, but sometimes that doesn't work. It, 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 you know, it's a problem. I want the perspectives from you about being on the, how do you look at your p p various positions from the inside as a patient okay, looking let's, out? Okay, let's hand it over. Should we just go from, from Willem to... And let's just uh, allow them to respond to that, anybody who would like to. Well, let's... Well, I mean, just very quickly, I mean, that's the question I ask, if my nosebleed progress, progresses, right? Looking from the inside out, I can imagine situations where I do not want to be told by experts, having tried everything for the best of reasons, to, to, to palliate, to help me, I can foresee a, a, a scenario where I say, help me in this particular way, that is my choice. And I don't hear that, and I, I just don't hear that. Um, I've experienced, uh, as a relative, um, people um, that have been very close to going through the process of dying. And from my perspective, um, uh, from the inside out, I can only speak for myself, but if I were in a situation where I um, were experiencing unbearable suffering, I would like, I would like to have access to palliative care. Um, I would like to have every opportunity to make my life as enjoyable as possible in my circumstances with the help of medical professionals, palliative care specialists, etc. And uh, just if despite all of that, I come to the point where um, I judge being mentally competent and fully informed that it's not in my own best interest to continue living. 
because it's just unbearable. Uh, then I would like the option. I would like to be able to choose um, to. I would like to be able to choose a premature death. I watched my father die for six weeks. Every night I would go and sit with him in the intensive care unit of the hospital where he was being cared for. And this was in 1988, where the prospect of his asking for a premature death was simply not contemplatable. But I did look down and think, Dad, I would like you to be able to ask us whether we as a family, what we think about stopping the suffering. Because the doctors tell us your chances of recovering are 1%. But because the medical aid is paying, these machines are attached to your body, and you are living this completely and utterly meaningless life. How do you feel about it? Um, which tells you that the arguments I've heard from my left have not changed the point of view with which I came here. But, Philip, you and then Liz can respond to that. Okay. Um, just to run through some of the points that have been made. Firstly, I would assert that uh, killing an innocent person is, uh, uh, that is murder in my definition, and I would like other people to put forward their definition of what they would say is murder as an absolute, not something they're going to change in a year's time because of some other court decision. Uh, then the next <coughs> question that was raised was uh, this uh, sad example from Christian history of uh, the Spanish Inquisition and such like. I would just interject that I happen to be a descendant of Jews that were expelled from Spain during that Inquisition. Um, um, and I acknowledge that there have been many things that have been wrong, done that have been wrong through Christian history. And one of the things that we have to also acknowledge is that human nature is basically sinful and tends towards sin unless it is restrained by something else, including the law. That is one of the arguments against euthanasia. Just but, because you don't agree with him, there's no need to react in that way. Please, okay. let's give the man the respect of listening to him, even though you might not agree with what he says. Okay, but... The principle of the sanctity of human life has made an absolutely enormous difference throughout the world when it has been acknowledged, including places where Christians happen to be a very small minority. You can take, for example, the outlawing of child sacrifice and sati in India. Uh, <clears throat> the euthanasia was banned in many parts of the world, and this view of the sanctity of life has been adopted in many other places, and many people identified from their own viewpoints that they share a similar view that people are created in the image of God, that they are not just advanced animals. The question of uh, chemotherapy and such like, you're welcome to stop your chemotherapy at any point. I have no objection but I do not believe that that can be used as a bargaining point in favor of active killing. Um, then, I, okay, I will defer this issue of experience of dying to my colleague, uh, Liz Gwyther. She has much more experience of that than myself. Then the, the question of who's going to help me. Uh, one socially needs to be in an infrastructure. You try and help yourself. Other, then next, your family. Then next, uh, the community around that. The largest uh, palliative care voluntary um, service in this, kind of, in this province is run by a Christian faith-based organization. Uh, but, and last of all, the state is a responsibility. But again, that is not leverage just because you don't have it for, in favor of allowing active killing. Uh, then just because... Okay. Um, okay. I'm, I'm conscious of time, if you don't mind. Um, Liz, could you keep it short? Because I see it's a fairly long line of people there and we do have time constraints. So yes, I have been at many people's deaths. And I'm not going to talk from my own experience, but I'm just going to say that one evening in hospice, the urologist came to see a patient who was under our combined care and experienced that man's death and said it was the most transcendent experience he had ever had in his whole life. The issue is to know when people need palliative care. And I, my... Heart is so touched by your story, John. Your dad should not have still been in ICU. And, it's, and doctors don't identify easily the people when to stop the inappropriate treatment. But discussions I have had with people who have brought up the question of euthanasia in an open and respectful way on both sides, it often says, so I, I would ask, so when? And they say, oh, when it's really bad. 
And that's when I say to my, to my students, medical students and postgraduates and doctors, our role is to make sure that it's not re ever that bad. But as you say, sometimes there is that episode, and I respect your story absolutely. And so often people imagine how dreadful it's going to be, but you, you experience that. Yeah. Okay, um, and there, there is a long line, so if we can just be conscious of time because people need to go and get ready for the supper and everything, yeah. Uh, I'm Erika Preisig, I'm a GP in Switzerland and I didn't want to speak about Hitler here, but I need to. Uh, Switzerland has opened its doors when, at, the, at the time of Hitler and uh, many people uh, run to Switzerland to save their lives. Now Switzerland has opened its doors since 20 years to people who want to die in peace and we got run over by people who want to come and we don't have enough dates to give them. We had a patient with uh, motor neuron disease. She said, I hope that I will uh, die from starvation because she couldn't swallow anymore before I die from suffocation. Uh, and uh, when she came to die in peace in Switzerland because she uh, started to have very, very bad breathing problems, especially at night, couldn't swallow the saliva, uh, she said, look at me and do photos. I'm so sorry that I haven't got that photo with me because she looked exactly the same as the people at the time of Hitler's from Auschwitz. Uh, this, what I'm experiencing, is the modern Holocaust. And... Uh, I'm a GP. When my patients found out that uh, it was in all the press uh, that I'm doing assisted dying, do you know what happened? I lost one a psychologist and I gained hundreds. We had to stop taking new patients because they all wanted to come to a, to a GP who knows everything about palliative care but who access, uh, accepts also assisted dying. I have been a palliative care doctor for 21 years. I never thought about assisted dying. Then my father wanted to die. He tried to suicide himself in my house. He lived with, with me and my children. I offered him because he then wanted to go under the train because he didn't succeed with his medication uh, suicide uh, trial. Uh, I, I offered him an assisted dying and this was very, very difficult for me as a palliative care doctor. Um, I couldn't accept what he was doing, but jumping under the train was even worse than assisted dying. So I, I had the duty, I, out of love to my father, I had the experience of an assisted dying. That changed my life completely. And I am so happy that I can give my patients both very, very good palliative care, but also assisted dying. And who the heck has the right to tell me how I die? I listen to my patients and I respect their wish if it's a wish of long duration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is to Liz and Philip, and it's a simple one. It's this. By what authority do you derive the power to command others to live a life that you perhaps find meaningful, but others do not? And I make this point because when you draft a constitution as we did in, 1990, in, the, in the 90s, early 90s, you try and keep in mind a well-ordered society. And a well-ordered society is a pluralistic society with different views and different values, and that's why you can practice and believe you know, your, your Christian faith and why we won't impede upon that, but by the same token, we expect you to respect the views and values of other people. I appreciate, Liz, that none of your patients uh, in particular have sought to die in this particular way, but it doesn't mean that there aren't patients who, who uh, would not like to die in that way. There are patients who would. And so I ask you, by what authority, and I know that the Constitution doesn't help you here, or the sanctity of life, because as a lawyer, you would know, that, well, I would know that the jurisprudence of our court says that the right to life means more than just physical existence, it means a meaningful life. So by what authority can you command others to live a life that you deem fit? Okay. Okay, to answer that question on multiple layers from, from God, from the 
<coughs> the, I believe the correct interpretation of the Constitution itself, the decision of our Parliament, the decision of uh, one and a half thousand years of precedent of civilization on which this, this law is based and which our country has adopted. Um, <clears throat> the question of what, how, what about ordering society, we have in some of the countries that you come from, you, draw, you drive on the left, other countries you drive on the right. One has to make a choice because if you do not make that choice, you're going to have collisions. Uh, we can have pluralism to some extent with freedom of religion, but we have to have a decision on the basis on which our law is decided. Uh, our constitution is not... Uh, secular as some claim. Uh, it uh, talks about God in multiple places, it, um, and that is an assumption where uh, the, <clears throat> at least, I think there's only one in 30 South Africans are surveyed by an international organization or even in doubt on the existence of God. Uh, most of them would interpret that from a Christian perspective or something analogous or very similar. And uh, that is <clears throat> the basis on which we, we, we decide many laws uh, on a consensus. And no, I don't believe this is something we can leave up to each individual to decide for themselves. Liz? So, so it's not so much authority, it's just really looking at the, the experience and looking at the little bit of kind of legal work, legal um, understanding that I've got through my um, study on the human rights documents. Things like the right to health is not the right to be healthy, but the opportunity for the highest attainable standard of health given the biological preconditions. And that also resonates with the palliative care principle as living as actively as possible in the face of that illness. So, the, so a lot of what palliative care does and a lot of what not just, and, and this is also beyond my particular part of the discipline, is the, the counseling that comes in actually helping a person or uh, accompanying the person, being a witness to how they, do, they find meaning in their lives. Thank you. Well, listen, first I just have to say, I think that I'm advocating for something, I'm advocating for one of the pillars, okay, which is the living will, as I think a lot of you would know. Now, from just listening, I would say that it sounds like Philip and Liz actually supports the right that a patient can, um, that a patient can have a living will. Um, but I want to go a step further. And the step is that I want to ask, I believe in, I've, I've just buried, my, my brother died on the 2nd of June. And I've seen palliative care. I've seen palliative care where he was given three to four pints of blood every two, three days to extend his suffering. Is that palliative care? Or is that seriously, until the medical aid is exhausted, we will continue with that palliative care? The question I want to ask about palliative care, is it palliative care only for the rich, for those who've got a medical aid? for those who can afford it. Please, can anyone tell me, is there any hospice or any place of palliative care that I can for any of my constituents in Johannesburg who is crying, please reach out, help us, there is nothing. Yeah, but if, if, if I could, because there are a lot of people. I mean, the, um, the, the point was made by Andrew. We're talking here about two things. We're talking about an ideal world. We're, we're talking about a constitution and a system which we could and should have. And then there is the real world. And, and James said that we need palliative care, better palliative care for all our population, which quite obviously we do not have at the moment. So... Yeah. No, but I've just got another question. That yeah. question is to Philip. Okay. How many coins, or how many sides is there to a coin of Christianity? We have got on religion, we've got Desmond Tutu that's saying um, he wants to go all the way. Okay. Then you've got a small political party in parliament that is not even supporting a living will. But so how, how many sides is there to the coin of Christianity? And my last final question is, and that is to Philip. Philip, have you ever held your father's hand? Have you ever held your brother's hand? Have you had a niece that was diagnosed with brain cancer at the age of four and that lived for 28 years with a tube in her stomach feeding her because doctors felt it's the right way? And I want you to just answer on that. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, I'm just going to, okay, there's two questions there. The one question is on the, the sides to Christianity. As I have said earlier, there's a consensus from the time of the first century through to the middle of the, uh, the 19th century when a particular set of ideologies arose in Germany, uh, which started to undermine many aspects of the civilization, which included uh, undermining the view of the sanctity of life uh, within the Christian church that has spread throughout the world. And these few people who are opposing this, uh, supporting euthanasia, are, uh, <clears throat> are all derived from that. And you can also note that their churches are emptying out and probably within another two generations will be entirely empty uh, because it is not genuine Christianity. Um, then the question of personal uh, views. And Look, if anybody wants to stay... Can, can, we, can we agree that for the rest of the session we'll leave Christianity out of this because it's taking us down blind alleys, please, from, from the questions and from the answers. This is a secular state. People have views on Christianity or they do not, and I don't think it's germane to the discussion that we're having here this afternoon, as framed by the topic of the debate. And, and I'm not sure it's a fair question to say to Philip, have you ever held the hand of a four-year-old who's been diagnosed with cancer? I really, I mean, you know. So next, please. Thank you. My question is in two parts, if that's okay. Um, but maybe I can just comment to that previous speaker and just say that I'm, you know, obviously you've gone through a lot of trauma yeah. and um, you know, I wish that she could have had access to someone like, like Liz for palliative care. I think it would have made a difference. And in Somerset West, we do have a hospice, the Helderberg Hospice, which is free for everyone. from People from townships and, and from Macassar and everywhere can come for free. So, but obviously there's not enough of that around the country. My question is in two parts. I would like to ask um, Professor Lundman you mentioned a situation of terminal care, for ex and you put yourself in the example where you felt that euthanasia might be warranted. Can you maybe give some other examples of where you think it is appropriate, and then say where you think it isn't appropriate? What would your criteria be? Would you restrict it to terminal care, or where would you restrict it? If you ask me what my personal conviction is, I do not think that being terminally ill is a necessary condition for legitimately asking to be assisted with dying. If you ask me whether as a first base for public policy in South Africa it is attainable, I have my doubts. Not yet. So, okay, so you've answered the first part. Uh, you confirm that you don't think it should be restricted to terminal care. We can be, we can, have a, we can have, let me make this distinction, we can have a terminal illness without yet being terminally ill. I can have motor neuron disease without being in a terminal stage. You agree, agree with that? So, um, I, I, I'm, I, that, is, that is one point. Um, so, are you talking about terminal illness or being in the final phase of... I'm just going to put you on the spot to, to actually um, grind you to answer the second part of the question. The first part was um, terminal care and, uh, okay, so I hear you, there's a patient who's terminally ill as well as somebody who's in the terminal stages of dying. You would think they're appropriate there. Where would you say it shouldn't be allowed? Where would you say it would stop? I think that, you know, my first basis I said this morning was... Uh, Interminal, uh, uh, intractable, unbearable suffering. Right. Uh, we can suffer in that way without being terminally ill or in a terminal stage of illness. And I would be sympathetic of that. I can imagine being quadriplegic. I mean, of course, quadriplegic patients or persons may choose differently, where I have had a certain st uh, style of life where I cannot bear it. For, the, for me, that would be unbearable suffering. And I would make a case for myself that I would like to be assisted to die. The classic case in Spain of Ramon San Pedro, where he's, you know, the movie um, made about that. I can imagine uh, having a motor neuron disease where um, you know, I, I suffer from a terminal illness. And at a certain stage, I would fear you know, being, being, you know, as it was said, suffocating or uh, being unable to swallow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There, I would be able, to, I w would want to be assisted. So it sounds like, in summary, you would say there should be no restriction at all in law, um, or 
you know, accept that the patient should I, ask I and say they have unbearable the, suffering. The point and that is would that be your opinion. Um, intractable suffering could be existential suffering. It need not be physiological, med medical yeah, I mean, suffering you'd, all you'd have defined to by certain indicators. You can't and, really and challenge and someone on it. Of, so yeah. no restriction is no, just no. to clarify. I would clarify that. I would exclude simply being tired of life for any spurious reason and claiming that you're suffering. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Because simply, um, you know, the, the practical situation... Suffering is, is subjective. One, pardon? Suffering is subjective. It's very subjective. No. So you would advocate for no, no restriction. Suffering is not simply subjective. I can see somebody suffering. I can I can see it. I can know from having the same no, physiological. Now against autonomy, because you want to judge yeah, an impartial um, judge to are say other, who's there suffering are other or is not. people waiting. Thank you. I think one, one of one no of the restriction. things. No restriction. I've got it. Thank you. Yeah, but but if I'm suffering existentially and I'm physiologically fine, I can go to the top of a building and jump off. I don't need anybody to assist me to die. I'm in full control of my faculties and can make that decision to die as I see fit in front of a train, slitting my wrists in the bath or whatever the case may be. And I think that's a critical distinction. But uh, next, please. Hi, I just wanted to ask a brief question to Professor Landman. I am personally a complete layman, a child in this room. If there's one thing I know, it's that I'm probably the person in this room who has spent the least amount of time thinking about this matter. So I do want to ask the question with a great deal of respect for the position that, that you occupy and the fact that you have thought about this for a lot longer than I have. But this is a simple-minded question. You appeal to human autonomy. I only have one, one question. On what basis do you establish the authority of human autonomy? And it's clear to me, or it at least appears to me, that there's no way you can establish that um, on its own. And what is also clear to me is that we all believe in fundamental restrictions on human autonomy. I can't kill you now if I want to, even though that would be within um, autonomy, self-law. So if I was a law to myself, I could kill you if I wanted to, but no, no one here would allow me to do that. Um, and no one is advancing, I'm sure, and I'm not accusing anyone of advancing uh, an argument uh, that I have a right to kill anyone that I want to kill. So what is the basis? What is this axiom that you're appealing to? Um, and how is it uh, not uh, a complete, um, again, with complete respect, how is it not a complete um, faith-based appeal to uh, cultural norms and standards rather than a, any kind of, um, than, a, than, a, than a serious intellectual argument. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to make sure about this. Are you asking me whether autonomy is a value, something that we should value, or that we can't, uh, or, or can, we, can we factually determine it? Can, uh, do we have difficulties actually determining whether somebody is acting freely and not under duress? Or asking me, is it something that we value? I'm asking you why you make the appeal to human autonomy as the, as, 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 as the, the basis for, for why an individual has a right to choose to end their life. Because if we can appeal to human autonomy for decisions of that order, then, then yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, I, having a defense of human, of, of, of human autonomy is, is sort of getting to, to the basics of being human. You know, I, d I don't think we need to go into that. I mean, that we make free choices, that we're not under the control of our genes, complete control of genes or other people, or, you know, that we value autonomy, having our own projects and values and decisions and the desires, and that, that we plan our lives according to our own value system, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is something that we value, that is part of, of, of defining what, what it is to be a human being. And we extend that to end of, end of life decisions within uh, other, other conditions. You know, as I said, the first base is uh, uh, unbearable and intractable suffering. And uh, to this previous speaker or questioner, um, uh, that that suffering must be of a certain kind, and we must agree on that. And in public debate, we agree on that. What what we mean by that suffering, and then the autonomy uh, comes into play there. That I do not, in terms of my life projects, in terms of my values, I do not see living like this 
as, uh, as, as infused with any dignity. It's something that I do not choose. I'm right at the end for argument's sake, I'm at the end of life, or I have a kind of life where I, I, I have no enjoyment any longer, then I will choose. And I don't harm anybody. I mean, that's, that's the point. That's, that's the key point, isn't it? I mean, you, you can exercise a human right as long as the exercising of your human right, right doesn't harm the human rights of anybody else. So if you exercise autonomy and kill Willem, you are harming Willem. If Willem exercises his autonomy to ask a doctor or somebody else to assist him to die, the argument is that nobody is being harmed. So it's an entirely different kind of autonomy. Um, we do have other people. Okay. Sorry, but... Well, I'm checking uh, airmen from Belgium involved in the right to die movement, but eventually also member of the Belgium von Auschwitz Foundation. So uh, I want to react so for several points. For, uh, first of all, in Belgium, doctors who agree to practice euthanasia. They are not professional of euthanasia. They are GP. They are specialists in oncology. They are specialists in intensive care. Uh, they are specialists in palliative care. Because, well, in Belgium, yes, there are some doctors who are specialists in palliative, uh, palliative care who are practicing euthanasia. My question should be, how do you explain the high quality, the high level of quality of palliative care in Belgium? Belgium has a reputation to have a good uh, network of palliative care. It could all the time be better, but to compare with other countries, we are quite good. That's one of the questions. Another question, I have heard that there were some so-called abuses in Belgium, in other countries, like in the Netherlands. Have you evidence of it? Or is it only what you have read in papers? And I invite you to read, for example, all the affidavits and evidence that we have given, given to uh, the Supreme Court in the Carter case. So, before speaking about abuses, you must think about bringing evidence of it. I am from Dignitas to live with dignity, to die with dignity in Switzerland. And I just wanted to add one or two points. There was word of the Hippocratical aid, uh, Hippocratical Oath. To my humble knowledge, the Hippocratical Oath has been replaced by the Declaration of Geneva uh, quite a few years ago. So I don't know of any doctor who is swearing the Hippocratical Oath anymore. And in the Declaration of Geneva, the Doctor's Declaration of Geneva, it says that doctors say, I'm not using my medical knowledge to violate civil rights and the, the basic human rights of uh, my patients. Now, in a case that Dignitas did a few years back, we brought the European Court of Human Rights to the point of saying that every competent adult has the right to decide on time and manner of his own end in life. So, in short, no medical doctor, no me palliative care doctor, no euthanasia doctor, no anyone has a right to decide on my time, I, my end in life. It's only the individual who has the right to decide on that one. And we are even one step further now that in a case that we did in Germany, the court acknowledged, German high court acknowledged, that in exceptional cases the state must give access to the means to have a dignified death, as otherwise people are risky to lose their dignity to lose their dignity and what is worse, they would go in front of a train, jump off a high building, shoot themselves, and so on. What we should do is and I do respect all opposing opinions to the assisted dying movement, uh, that we do not dig a ditch between palliative care and assisted dying, maybe assisted suicide or voluntary euthanasia, but we respect that we have to bring these things together, implemented in health care, because what is at the center is the individual who decides whether his life has quality or not. Thank you.
Hello. Um, so I have an argument uh, against the principle of autonomy supporting euthanasia, as I think it's become quite clear that it's the fundamental principle used, being used to support it. So, and please be specific in any criticisms. So my first point is that our autonomy extends to choosing between good things and neutral things. For example, we can choose between the goods of becoming a doctor and an engineer, or between the neutral things of uh, muesli or oats for breakfast. It doesn't extend to choosing immoral things like theft or rape. My second point is that we have incredible inherent value as human beings, regardless of what anyone may say. For example, slaves on Jamaican plantations in the 1800s had incredible intrinsic value, regardless of what they or their owners or society at large thought. It would be, and I think it would be barbaric to deny that. Thirdly, it's immoral to destroy something of incredible value. No one has the right to destroy something of incredible value. No one does. Putting that together, euthanasia is the destruction of something incredibly valuable, a human being, and as such, it's immoral. Since our autonomy does not extend to choosing immoral things, we therefore do not have the autonomy to kill ourselves. Autonomy, therefore, does not, in fact, support euthanasia. So, thank you. So let's get a different voice and bring the microphone over here. Okay, do you, do you want to go first? No, you please. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, just, just, you know, I, I simply don't understand how you can say autonomy has nothing to do with moral choices. Is that what is that is being said? My point was that you do not have the autonomy to make immoral choices. It's similar to the one that was raised earlier. To make where, immoral choices. Yes, Immo I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, you obviously can do it, but I mean, it's autonomy wouldn't support you doing that. I, I simply don't follow. I mean. Uh, you, you can know, can we a, just move on to the last person then? Because I mean, essentially, this, this side of the table is arguing that the right to die is a moral choice. You're arguing that it's immoral. So there's there's a difference of opinion. Oh, there's see. no there's no philosophical differential oh, here. Okay. okay. Um, so thanks very much for making that argument. The last one. There was also, you know, if I could just say something of incredible moral value, I can, I can imagine myself descending into a state where I didn't think I have incredible value. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, I don't think we agree on, 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 on the definitions of, of these. Uh, how do you decide whether I have incredible moral value if I'm in just, the last stage? I'm sorry, I hate being a headmaster, but I'm very conscious of time. And there is one more person. I'd like everybody to have a very brief closing argument, and then folk need to go on. So these, these are arguments that can perhaps be picked up um, later one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Tagar? I live in South Africa for 15 years and originally educated and trained in Soviet Russia, and we grew up as an atheist. And graduating as a medical doctor and becoming holistic uh, uh, practitioner and accompanying people through the process of dying grew me up as a human being into understanding uh, who we are, because it was a question here, who are you to decide? And it is an existential question, who we are as a human beings. And if we can suggest that we are human beings uh, made of body, soul, and spirit, it brings different aspect for what we are talking about. And in that regard, uh, also we are talking about uh, uh, Hippocratic Oath, that in 21st century somehow becomes uh, question in its values. It was for two and, th two and a half thousand years leading for our medical profession. And suddenly it is a big question. We have to make some adjustments. And that's why it is a big question for us in 21st century. Who we are as a mankind, who we are become, and how our medicine developed that we reach that point. Are we in crisis? And uh, undoubtedly, Maybe also what you are bringing. We are in crisis because medicine becomes so materialistically orientated that human spirit somehow is not present in medicine through treating patients from early st stages. But we also know that the final stage of life it is, can become very speed up point on the spiritual growth of individual. Who have seen that spirit at work? We have seen it with the Holocaust survivors, and this is undoubtful. And those suffering those days was unnecessary, for sure. 
but I was privileged to meet the survivors here in South Africa. And if the spirit could overcome it, and we lost 26 million in World War II, so this is people to point. How did they survive? In opposite, we have got another dynamic. Sorry, could you drive to your final point? Please? Yes, I would like to bring a bigger picture that the people who now grew up through World War II in masses requesting euthanasia in Europe, what happened with those people? Because their parents and their families suffered enormously. So where is that critical point we are at to look at human beings. And of course, the point- Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. I, I did say no long speeches, and it's getting to that point. But thank you very much for making that. Can we, we'll start, Philip, with you, and we'll just go across the table, and people can um, just final comment, brief final comment. Yeah, well, I'll give three responses to some of the points that have been made. The first is that this interpretation of autonomy, which, where there's an intent by, uh, attempt to try and insert that meaning of autonomy into the Constitution, I don't believe is something that was ever intended by the framers of the Constitution. I was around at the time. I don't think a single one was advocating that, uh, that interpretation. And I believe that that is the equivalent of a religious viewpoint that is attempted to being imposed. It's just not a formalized religious viewpoint. The second qu example is the question of <coughs> abuses. There is a very public case at the moment, which is multi sourced in, uh, in multiple sources in the Netherlands and in the Telegraph newspaper, for example, where there's a dementia patient in the Netherlands who had wavering consent, sometimes in favor, sometimes against uh, euthanasia. Uh, the doctor uh, gave the uh, lady some sedative in her coffee without her knowledge uh, and <clears throat> without explicit consent at the time. She then woke up from the sedative and he asked the, doc the family to hold her down while he injected her with a lethal injection and killed her. Now, initially, he was clear cleared of that, amazingly, I assume by other doctors who do Philip, the same. I'm sorry, yeah. but you are going on. Can we okay. just, if I said a brief closing okay. statement, not another Okay, my question is who will condemn that as murder, uh, as an absolute? I would condemn it as murder on the basis of the facts that you've given. There might be other facts which would cause me to change my mind. Liz? So my closing statement, sorry, my closing statement is around palliative care that truly promotes patient autonomy in the context in which we work and supports beneficial treatment. And we support individual dignity and engage the patient to lead that. But you've heard my bias. I do think that euthanasia is unnecessarily extreme. I agree with, I agree with uh, Liz. Um, I'm in favor of quality palliative care and in favor of patient autonomy and dignity. Um, my central claim I'd make is that a legalization of assisted dying in South Africa would, in principle, be consistent with the Constitution, which is an ethical foundational document of a secular modern liberal democracy. And the legalization of assisted dying would be consistent with that. Uh, I'm not making a broader blanket statement. That's an in-principle statement, not an all-things-considered statement. Um, and that would obviously be caveat to just one more sentence. <laughs> but uh, however the law is developed, it must be subject to appropriate, empirically verified safeguards against risk of abuse um, and must take into account South African context. And then, Willem, final word. I... Uh, the, the debate is an illustration of what I said this morning, that uh, if we simply uh, argue on the basis of philosophical persuasions, religious, cultural persuasions, um, then it's going to be an interminable debate. Uh, interminable debate. It will not, will not end. Uh, luckily for us, uh, in South Africa, we have a, a constitutional democracy, and the question is, do the rights in the Constitution, do the rights in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution support uh, 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 recognizing this practice as something that's legal would be uh, legal in South Africa, that could be legal in South Africa. In order to do that, clearly we'll have to do not the 68 of Victoria, but we'll have to have certain uh, criteria set down to have this as a legal 
uh, recognized as a legal practice. And the key ones I mentioned this morning, they came up again. All of these criteria we can define, we, we, we need to have definitions, and then we can make a factual determination. I can define what autonomy is, and I can make a factual determination. In the same way as we ask whether somebody who signs a contract to, to buy a house or to sell something, um, uh, you know, is, is acting autonomously or under duress. In the same sense, we can, dis we can discuss whether somebody is competent to make that decision, we can define competence, and we can determine it factually in a situation. And then lastly, suffering, which I've defined as uh, unbearable and intractable suffering. Not spurious suffering, not claiming that you're suffering, but real suffering. We can define that and we can factually determine it. And that'll be the basis, the first three criteria of the others, you know, how many, how many physicians have to certify and how many requests and are they written, et cetera, et cetera, they can follow suit after these basic ones. Thank you very much. Um, Philip and, and Liz have come into largely hostile territory and that has taken some courage for them to, to keep going. So thank you very, very much to you and to James and Philip and thank you to all of you.